Welcome to Medieval Church. <laughs> Have you ever seen something, watched it either on video, on television, or you went to a live performance? Maybe you paid for some tickets, you took some time to see your favorite movie, or you went to maybe a Broadway production, or maybe you just went to church like I did just now, and you were putting together your presentation of what God had done, and you, you looked at something that you've been using regularly, and then suddenly it all of a sudden hit you and grabbed you by the gonads, so to speak. He had grabbed a hold of your soul and twisted you up, and you just went, oh my God, that's awesome. That is so good. That's sick. I mean, that's the way we talk, or we used to talk in some ways in the hip-hop, you know, kind of, kind of say Oh, that's sick, dude. That's just, oh, man, that, that's so over the top. It was just awesome. Well, that's kind of what God's like, really, when you figure out what it's all about. It's not about this miserable existence that a lot of Christians are living, you know, somehow whining and complaining and, you know, shining and hiding and finding a way, you know, to make life miserable in a way that God said, hey, celebrate. I remember the days of old, and I meditate on them in my morning hours when we used to rejoice every day. We used to celebrate Jesus. We used to dance and laugh and sing. And I look at people nowadays, and I think, my God, is that your idea of worship? You know, you kind of watch them for a while, and you go, well, let's see. It took you three hours to do setup, two hours to do a sound check. You got one hour of presentation. It may you got the crowd jumping up and down excited and joy-filled for about 20 minutes, and then, you know, you're done. You know, I mean, that might be good for you. That might be some way that you involve yourself in what God's Spirit is doing. <laughs> i got news for you. Once you're done with the concert-style ministry, once you're done with the ego-style worship service that, you know, goes, ooh, wow, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ting, ting, you got a wall the big bag going. You know, once you're done with that, you still got to go home, you know? And then you're like, well, that was a good service. Yeah, what was it about? I don't know, but it was good. Man, it's not like, you know, suddenly joy captures your heart. Like you say, remember when Jesus spoke to us? His words burned in our hearts. It was so awesome. Man, we just had to burst forth singing. It was so wonderful that we just had to do something about it. As a matter of fact, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I had to go tell somebody. Got to tell somebody. Gotta tell somebody. Gotta tell somebody. Gotta tell somebody. Gotta tell somebody what Jesus did for me. You know, that kind of Jesus freak attitude. That Pentecostalism that blew the doors off of the church and said, hey, no more are we going to be dead. But my God's not dead. He's surely alive. Is that really what your church is like? Or are you missing the point about why you should be different? Why you should be unique and distinctive? Why your service to God isn't a church service, but the reality of your everyday life should be full of joy. Jesus said it this way, that I'm praying for you that your joy may be made full. This is what I give unto you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you, because in the world you'll have tribulation. And, you know, you got a good reason to be bummed. Dude, you got a good reason to be, you know, sorrowful. You know, you got pretty good reasons to, you know, need my peace. And I'll give you my peace. But I got news for you. I got something more in store. It's not just walking around with me and talking with me, you know, and living this life for three and a half years and seeing what miracles there are. Oh, that's good. That's inside the church. You know, I mean, that happens. And it's not just, you know, praying our Father, which, you know, that's good for three and a half years you've been with me, you know, and, those are wonderful things I got for you, you know, and hey, if you're satisfied with, you know, three and a half years of that, that's wonderful. But, you know, I want something more for you. I got something in store for you. I've got something that's going to blow your mind, that's going to knock your socks off. I've got a joy that's going to be your strength that nothing can conquer, that the very Gates of hell shall not prevail against you because you'll laugh at it. You'll sing, you'll dance, you'll rejoice. You'll bring the 
priest before the enemy and you will laugh at him with joy because you'll be celebrating the wonder of who God is, of how God has blessed you and how God is using you. That's what happened to me right now. <laughs> Matter of fact, my wife's probably in the other room thinking, oh no, what got into him? He was dead to the world about maybe an hour ago, snoring from after doing what, you know, he'd done in Sunday morning, you know, and then come home and, you know, kind of vegging and, you know, trying to get some calories in. And now all of a sudden, what happened and got into him? Joy by surprise. Joy opens up his eyes. You know, sorrow endures for an evening, but joy cometh in the morning. What if joy came in the afternoon? Well, I got news for you. I I was watching this we have video church in the morning, the sunrise service. And I love sunrise service. I mean, I don't just love the sunrise service in the sense of what we do with, you know, God using me to share a message with you or tell you about Jesus. But I never really get a chance to explain because every time, by the time I get to church, I've already experienced so much of God that I forget about sharing it with you. You know, like when I'm driving down to the church, I'm looking out over the basin and the air is crystal clear. And people haven't gotten up yet. And it's like God and I looking out over the entire Salt Lake Basin and watching the light bring life into the world. It's as though from the midst of chaos comes this reality of God breaking forth the day. And I'm watching it and I'm listening to God talk to me. And I'm going, wow, Lord, man, I got to tell the people about this. This is so cool. I can't just keep it for myself. I want them to experience what you and I do every day when it's sunrise service. And I never really get a chance to tell you about it, you know, because by the time I get to the service, it's like, well, you know, you set up the camera, you know, and we don't do very much setup, but it's just like, throw the camera up and get going and get on with it, you know, and sunrise is there. And we talk about Jesus, you know, and the things that people need to hear on Sunday, because they have expectations, you know, so you gotta tell them about salvation, you know, kind of like those qualifications, you know, so that they can, you know, understand that God loves them. But, you know, I was surprised by, we have these musical parts that we add to the message at the beginning of the service, you know, before the service starts, which is just happy. And it really, you know, pretty much sums up who I am and how I like to be. I'm not always happy. My wife knows it. I get moody at times, just like you. And I get grumpy at times, just like you. I get grumpy, grumpy, and stumpy, you know, and it's acting like, you know, the 12 dwarfs. And sometimes I'm like that, you know. Here I've got Snow White, you know, and I'm acting like the dwarfs. You know, maybe not, you know, Doc, but the rest of them. So in a lot of ways, you know, we go through these stages, and it's not the, you know, 12-step program, but it's similar, you know, in the way that Satan wants to keep us bound up and found up and disguised by the lies that he's presented in the world that we can't enjoy and be a part of the joy that God has given us every day to live. So I was amazed when I looked at the end of the service, when we have this music video that we put on the end of the service after, you know, this kind of like message from Francis Chan and stuff, you know, and it was like, he's alive, he's alive. And I just like, I just started, it gives me a kick in the head. I mean, I'm, I'm like, face slap. Oh, man, I forgot. I'm a Christian. This is me. You know, this is us. This is what we do. You know, and I'm watching them and, and it's a joyful celebration. It's a lifting up of Jesus. It's just talking about and dancing about and sharing about Jesus. And I remember dancing in the March for Jesus. I remember dancing. I go out dancing, as a matter of fact, put bluntly. And it's a joy of my heart. It's a celebration of my soul. It's something I like to do that makes me whole. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want to see in the services, you know, more so than I see these people that are sitting in pews not knowing what they do, you know, because they look like they got dues that are due. You know, they pay their tithes and then they're miserable sitting there because they just donated money and now they're kind of going, man, you know, I don't really have, you know, God hasn't blessed me yet, you know, so I'm not really that happy about this, you know, I'm kind of like, I just spent so much money on this church, you know, and now I put it in the, the, the you know, little basket that passes by and, you know, now I could have used that on a football game. You know, I could have had concert seat tickets, you know. I could have been doing all these other things with my money. But, you know, now I'm sitting here in church on a Sunday morning when I could be watching football or baseball. Or, you know, it's Mark Madness. I could be watching basketball or doing something else besides sitting here in church, you know, putting up with God, you know, getting blessed. You know, that's how we are in the pews as we do our dues to God. After all, isn't that what pews are for, doing our dues? 
And I'm like, man, you know, I want to set the pews on fire. <laughs> That's why we assemble ourselves together outside the church so that we don't find and be contaminated by what's inside the church. I'm more like, hey, you know what? You don't have to come where I'm at because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm employing the vision of what God promised us we could have, that Jesus told his disciples, look, I know you think you got it all because here you've been doing miracles. You saw Satan fall. You've been, you know, very religious in these three and a half years you've been with me, but I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it, you know, kind of like a checkout time to go back to where I belong, which is in heaven, because no offense, but this is kind of like my goodbye song to you. So I got one other thing I want to give you that's going to blow your mind. I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you get the Holy Spirit. And when you get him, baby, are you going to have joy? It'll be dunamis, dynamite. Kind of like, you know, that old black comedy used to say, dynamite. You know, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be contained and refrained and, you know, repeated three times on some worship chorus, you know, and then you got to down Hey, we're going to take it up beat. Now, let's pour four. Clap your hands, all you people. Down the God, the boys are trying, you know. And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoopie dippy dippy doo. We are clapping and at you. No, it should be when you see something, rejoice. When you know something, give voice. When you feel it, then be it. Live it. Don't just do it and fake it. Because I got news for you. Every time I see a church, say, okay, let's everybody stand up now and sing a song. Everybody stands up and I think, sit down. Shut up. Don't sing, please, because I can out-sing all of them. I mean, I've been in churches where it's like, hey, you know what? You better be five feet away from me. Okay, back up 50 feet away from me because I'm giving it all I got. I'm worshiping with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind and strength. I'm giving God the rejoicing attitude of my heart that is just out there over the top. I don't want you to put up words on the, the billboard or whatever you do with that. I want to be not distracted by the attraction of the world and its ways. I want to know Jesus in a personal, intimate way that it comes out of my heart. Matter of fact, take what musicians, you guys shut up for a while. I'll sing on my own. Woohoo! No, I guess you don't do that, do you? <laughs> Bummer, dude. You're missing out. So we've been studying in Colossians, you know, on Sunday nights, and so we're going back to Colossians to remind ourselves of those things we're missing out on. Those things that we should be talking about with. Those realities of God that should be in our life. And Paul being one of those people who had experienced God in such a personal intimate way that he even said, hey, you know what? I've already been miserable. Now I want to be like the Gentiles. I want to go out and drink, drink and be merry like they're doing. I want to celebrate the thing that God has given me so that I can see that there's a joy and that there's a discipline and there's a structure. So when he was speaking to the Colossians, he was reminding them of certain aspects of the reality of knowing God in a personal, intimate way, but in the world having a certain discipline so that you wouldn't be just like, you know, flopping and stomping and, you know, like fish out of water, just, you know, flopping all over and knocking things over and knocking them down or, you know, not some kind of recognition that joy does have a certain amount of, you know, parameters, maybe not, but you understand that church in some ways is good for people that need to learn some things, you know, some disciplines about knowing how to conduct your life so that you can have joy, conduct your prosperity and your directions and your inflections of the things that you're doing in your daily world as you're living them out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because most of you, that when you get out of church, you know, you're on a downer. Or you go over and you have church, you know, at a restaurant, you know, and then the restaurant's watching you like, wow, those are Christians. Here comes the Christian rush. Oh, boy. Cheap tippers. You know, we know the Christians are off. It's Sunday. Guess what? They flood the restaurants. Hello, how about we don't flood the restaurants? How about we do something different, you know, like go downtown and bring everybody in town, you know, from downtown to the town that you're at, you know, so they could eat something or enjoy it or be a part of it. Wouldn't it be nice if that suddenly when churches let out, they flooded the street people? Wouldn't it be nice if they just flooded those that were in need or suddenly, you know, like somebody looked out their door and they go, oh my God, what's going on in my house? It's being painted. The house is being, my car is being washed. Uh, the yard's being fixed up. You know, all these things are happening. These people must have just got out of church. They're putting into practice what they just heard. Why not? To me, that's more real than the reality of what most people do after church. And you know what you do after church. So we're in Colossians, reading from chapter 2, and we're talking about particularly 
those Judaizers and those people that were so religious, they wanted to suppress the joy of the Lord. They were so adamant about how you have to live your life. They wanted to stop you from drinking and stinking and living and doing and breathing and breathing, you know, and being something you're not to become what they want you to be. You know, you couldn't have a beer, dear, because guess what? Now you're in a ministry, so you can't have a glass of wine. Oh, no, God knows you might trip somebody up because, after all, they're sticking their feet between your legs, and you know that, you know, that's the way it should be. You can't dare say, oh, boy, God bless you, you know, and have a glass of wine with someone else or have a beer, you know, with your loved ones or your relatives because, after all, the Judaizers might find out. And that's what religion is like a lot of times. Oftentimes it makes the right statement, but it puts the wrong application in it and of it in the time that is not needed. If I go to a country and it's drinking, I'm drinking. If I go to a country and they're eating, I'm eating. If I go to a country and they're, you know, like, kind of like, hey, you know, I'm going to go, well, okay, Lord, you know, if you send me, I'll do what you want me to do. But the point of it is this. Whatsoever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind, and all of your strength. As we do at Vinigo Church, we say it's got to be this Bible, not the Word Bible, but this Bible as God breathes life into it and makes it fit in your life. It has to be the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God, Jesus. You have to be receiving whatever's said as though God's speaking to you or you're not getting what God wants for you and you're just dead in your own trespasses and sin. Because when you hear God speak, it brings life. When you know God is speaking to you, it brings conviction. When you know and you hear and you see God doing that in your life, it brings joy. Rather than being bondage and enlightened of the Christian life where it puts you into a certain place of having to do something, God says, I want you to be something. So we're reading in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, about to sneeze, ah, uh, chewy. Yeah. Where it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Jesus. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility worship of angels or intruding those things which they have not seen, but they're vainly puffed up in their fleshy mind of doing those things that are not profitable to you. And not holding the head from which all of the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ for the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? In other words, why do you have to go back to doing what somebody's telling you to do? Rather than getting yourself bondage and in bondage to where, you know, the first thing I know that a brother of mine that, you know, wanted to go back to church, he says, to me, he said, well, you know, I, I went back to this Calvary Chapel, you know, I went back to this church, you know, and I, you know, kind of, I had an experience. I said, oh, yeah, what happened? And he said, well, you know, I, I told them that, you know, I was going through a divorce and, you know, they didn't want to help me. And I was like, well, yeah, that sounds like Calvary Chapel. You know, a lot of Calvary Chapels don't know what they're doing, you know, or a church or any church that you might be a part of. Because, you see, it's not the question of us telling someone what to do or forcing our agenda upon someone. But when someone's hurting and in a need, you pray with them, you accept them, and you love them. That's what we're talking about in John or in Colossians chapter 16 through 20, or verse 16 through 20 in chapter 2. Because you're already dead. You've got the death sentence upon your life. There's nothing you can do for your salvation to add to it or to take away from it. Your salvation is assured by what Jesus has done in giving you life, in saying, hey, I've given you my Holy Spirit even. Let him teach you and convict you and lead you. Don't be caught up in the rudiments of the world, which are just simply a shadow of things where you didn't have the Holy Spirit. But now that you have the Spirit of God within you, he will lead you into all truth. He will instruct you in the words that I've spoken unto you. He will remind you of what I've said unto you. He will show you how to live. He will give you the ability and the capability to live a life that's pleasing in God's sight because that's how I lived my life three and a half years. You saw me and you knew I depended upon God to give me the ability to live as I did. For even in the same way that I live my life, you can live yours. Depended upon and observant to do those things that the Spirit of God is telling you to do, as I did of my Father. And God wants you to do as He loves you so much so that He gave 
you to me, and he gave me to you. So being that I'm in charge of everything, then when we all fit together cooperatively as a body fits together like hands and fingers and toes and nose and eyes and ears, it don't all look pretty when it's cut apart, but when it's all together working and functioning, we can celebrate, can we not? And so that's what it's saying in verse 16 through 21 and gets to the place where it says, touch not, taste not, handle not. It's like, ooh, you know, you can't, you can't be involved with those people. You know, don't get involved with, you know, the pedophiles. Don't get involved with the Mormons. Don't get involved and go to one of those churches. Don't dare, you know, even be involved with a Muslim. You can't talk to them. You can't share with them. You can't love them, you know, because they might get involved with ISIS. After all, we need to kill our enemies. We don't need to love them. Why would we want to love them? They might get saved that way. Or why should we love Democrats when we're a Republican? Or why should we, as a Republic or a Democrat, love the Republicans? I mean, after all, both are hypocrites. So what equality is there? There is much, because even as we are told in that with which is said in chapter 2, verse 20, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, if you be dead with Christ from the principles of the world, if you be dead in Jesus from everything that involves your life in the world, then guess what? You're dead to that. You're dead to the way the world does its things and the way that the world lives because the world is dying and decaying. We know by the first law of thermodynamics, the first law of physics and the law of thermodynamics that everything is wearing down, where God says, no, I'm bringing you eternal life. I'm lifting you up. Let's lift up the name of Jesus and find ourselves rejoicing rather than voicing our frustration and aggravation with each other. There should be a celebration of praise coming by the way of Jesus coming so soon. When sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So the greater the sinner, the greater the grace. That's what you should be giving, not giving your obstinate face to say, oh, I'm sorry, I just don't do them. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I can't be there. You know, Mr. Franklin, he's after all the spokesperson for Christianity. Mr. Franklin says that you are evil. You are the Antichrist. You are doing things wrong. I got news for you. Mr. Franklin is just Franklin. That's all. Franklin Graham. He's not Billy Graham because Billy Graham would pray with and pray for each and every president that he was a with. I got news for you. Just because every once in a while Franklin throws a spiritual bone out doesn't mean that politically he's right on. Because guess what? When you involve yourself in the world, of the world, by the world, and to the world, then you're using the world's ways in order to accomplish things that God never said to do that way. God said, love not the world nor the things of the world. For the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, against these you will fail because you are a sinner, but you've been raised with Christ where you must be seated in the heavenly places. So seek not the things that are here on earth, whether they be political or politicians or Fox News or some prestigious part of being in a political party of a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or whatever you want to call yourself. The reality of what God wants you to do is to celebrate Him to make it so obvious that you just want to explode with happiness. You want to devote yourself to the joy of the Lord. You want to find yourself in the peace that passes all understanding that none of these things move you, as Paul has said that that's what we should do. For as he says in verse 22, which all are to perish with the using thereof, and after the commandments and doctrines of men, why would you follow them? Because those things will be taken away. The reality of what's going to be eternal life is that you have a personal knowledge of Jesus. You have an ongoing and a revelatory experience of seeing and knowing God in that intimacy that only Jesus could bring to you because he said, no man has seen God at any time, but the Son of God, he hath revealed him who is in the bosom of the Father. He wants you to see God. He wants, you to, to, he wants to show off his Father to you. He wants you to be so filled with his Spirit that you become likened unto Jesus and you can't help but love God our Father in such a way that you're willing to give up the world and its ways. So why are you doing those things over again that God has said, don't do those things? Which things indeed have a show of wisdom. Oh yeah, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of wisdom out there. You know, Confucius say, Kung Fu says, you know, Hung Kung Charlie says, you know, Mama says, you know, Mother's Tales, Wives' Tales, Proverbs says, the Bible says. Well, the Bible's got wisdom, but that doesn't mean God said doesn't mean God is showing you. It doesn't mean that God is revealing to you. God wants you to be living out the reality of the words. And then suddenly you discover, oh, yeah, that's what God said when he said, this is the word and the word with faith flesh. I have become the living word by my actions rather than my stating it. 
But that's not what you are meant to be. You're meant to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So when we see in verse 23, it says, which indeed have a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor of the satisfying of the flesh. He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other 30 different sects of Judaism were because they couldn't get along with each other. On the one hand, they looked very religious. On the one hand, they looked very spiritual, but they didn't have any power thereof. They weren't able to change a person's life. They weren't able to develop in a way that God wanted us to have the joy. So he says finally in chapter 3, verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Jesus sits on the right hand of God. And that's the point that we should be living our lives out at. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Yes, you'll look like you're holy. Yes, you'll look like you're righteous. Yes, you'll look like you're fasting and doing all these other things, but you do it as a celebration of the joy, of the exultation that you feel inside of you, that you wake up like, wow, I can't wait to go to church. Man, I can't wait to get out of church and tell somebody. I can't wait to celebrate what I've just heard. I remember it all week long, telling everyone what the master of disaster, you know, in coming again and going to reveal to us the joy of the salvation that we could be spared of the great tribulation that's coming upon the world to try men's hearts and souls to see what's the matter of person they be, whether they be in the faith or not, then the determination of which is that which I have become is simply by obviousness of the peace and the love and the joy that I have in my heart for everyone that's alive and the fact that I love them and I have peace towards them and I have joy means that I am one of his and I'm going to be taken away. Take me away, Calgon. Clean me up. Mr. Cleanup Man, you know, I forget what that was, the white tornado or something, look through the house. Well, come into this house, you know, and clean me from the inside out. And let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Not some ordinance, well, you know, if you do this, you get this, and if you take this promise and you sign your name to it and you get that, you know, then you can negotiate with God and you can come up with that conclusion and you can be prosperous and you get more money and more, you know, possessions and more dispossessions, you know, and he could dispossess your attention span so that that way you're more focused on what you got to do to keep those possessions possessed because after all, they're going to possess you anyway. So guess what? You should have more possessions rather than give them away, right? Deny yourself, A, take up your cross, B, C, follow Jesus. I don't think he meant that like only once. I think that he means that every day of your life. I got news for you. If you can't walk away from everything you've got, then guess what? Everything you've got has got you. Yeah, you've been got. You don't got Jesus. Because Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have their nests, and nowhere is the Son of Man to lay his head. And he lived it out and proved it. For this world was not his home, and he was just passing through. When Christians say that today, I look at them and I say, liar. You're lying to me. I see where you live. I see how you live. You're living with a very heavy hand on possessing the possessions, and you're possessed by your possessions. You got it, but you didn't give it away, so it's got you now. So what can you say today if Jesus said, get up and go? Would you walk away, and do you know that Jesus is telling us to do that? To go where he would lead us. To do what he would tell us. To be as we should live, like we are led by the Spirit of God. For even as Paul said, hey, you know, I'm just a, you know, I'm nobody special. My vocation is just simply, I'm a, I'm a tent maker. You know? I mean, I, I had a pretty easy job, you know, <laughs> stitch and sew, you, now you know, you know, I mean, that's the way it goes, you know, for Paul. And yet, did he run around getting paid to do what he was doing? No, not if you really look close and you understand anything about Jewish customs and Jewish law. No, he didn't. Rather, he provided for the ministry himself, his own ministry. He wasn't given that with which, you know, to use. He used it for other means. It was always through his hands to someone else through his hands to someone, something else, always going from one to the other, not for him to be a part of, or to someone take the glory from God for what he's been given. Because Paul was given a second chance to live his life out even more so as zealous, as joy-filled after talking to Jesus and going to heaven and speaking with him and knowing God and having God speak to him of what it was going to happen with the Gentiles and how much he would have to suffer in order to accomplish the will of God that he wanted more than anything else in life. So he's willing to give up his life in order to accomplish the purpose that God had given him. What if God came to you today? Are you willing to give up your life in order to follow Jesus? Are you willing to say, hey, you know what? It wasn't much of a life anyway. So even now that I've been a Christian for 40 years, do I really want all of this? Or am I willing to someday just be raptured away and say, man, I ain't even looking back. 
You don't have to worry about lots of life. There is nothing I want in this life because everything I want is out there, not in here. And everything I want will be up there. So I set my affection on the things that I see God doing rather than what man is doing. And yet, what do we see as Christians in life today doing so much so about their ministry, about their jobs, about their wife, their life, their kids, and all these other things that distract them from the simple act of being in love with Jesus, knowing God in that personal, intimate way. Are you willing to give up everything to find him and then pursue him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength that you would not live without knowing God that intimately so that you're willing to put all these other things aside so that you would spend the quality time that God wants you to have intimately with him first and foremost and always and last? Or are you willing to put all these other things and say, well, after all, since I'm a Christian, since I'm born again, I have to have a good witness and a good testimony. You know, I got to keep my wife and keep my car and keep my kids and keep my house and keep my job and keep all these things in order. You know, the rudiments of the world. Because after all, that is what I'm seeking first, the world and its ways, so that way I can have a better testimony today than I did yesterday. Because I once was a sinner, but now I'm saved, so now I'm a saint. Really? Really? You really think that's what Jesus did? You see, Jesus coming today wouldn't be any different than he was in those days. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whether he comes to the Colossians, the Ephesians, the Galatians, the Philippians, the Thessalonians, to Sardis, the Thessalonica, to whatever church he goes to, he's going to be the same. He isn't going to come like, you know, some kind of like, you know, oh, well, look at me, I'm holy. No. You see, he's going to come and he's going to look at the poor that are right beside you. And he's going to say, what did you do with these? These were my brethren. What did you do with those? Those were the ones that I sent you to. Have you done the things I said? So the reality is you can rejoice and be glad because you've been given the Holy Spirit to know what these things are that he said unto you. You can be excited by the very fact that God wants you to celebrate life and to enjoy it in such a way that it will overflow out of you to everyone around you. But if you're not full of joy and you're not full of love and you're not experiencing peace, then I got news for you. If you're in a church, you're a hypocrite. And you're a failure when it comes to your relationship with God, and God will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because not only are you lukewarm, you're not even cold enough for God to use in some way to infuse that light that God has given to you from the very beginning. Where he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Take it. Break it up. Make it palatable to yourself in some way. Look at your life and find today if you find yourself in the faith. Because if you're in the faith, then you'll walk in the way that God wants you to, and you'll acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord, and he is your Savior, and he is your Master, and you want to go where he goes, do what he does, and say what he says. Because if you're up compromising and changing in any way, shape, or form anything that God has said to all of us, then most of us are going to look at you and say, No, no, no. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a pretender. You're contending for what you're not doing, but rather, if you're doing what Jesus said, then we're going to come up to you and say, hey, that's awesome. Man, I want what you got. That is amazing. I am thrilled to see in you the glory of my King. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. That's what we should be doing. Blessing, not cursing. So, if we could sum up this study tonight to say that we need something more than what we got, I would say this. Yes, we do. We need to get our mind off of the things we do and more on the things we live. For we live not in this world, but we should be seeking those things that are above, that God would bring down his kingdom to earth, that he would bring heaven to earth. And he does that through the very nature of the Holy Spirit inside of you. For if you do not have heaven on earth, it's because you don't have the Spirit of God within you. For all you need do for God to use you, all you need do to be saved, all you need to do to receive the Holy Spirit is but ask. Ask and you shall receive, Jesus said, and it's that simple. God, give me your Holy Spirit. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, as David prayed, but fill me with you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Cause me to be born again. Fill me to overflowing that I might know the things of the Spirit, to rejoice in the love you've given me, to involve myself in the peace that you have developed for me, that I can have that as two legs to stand on so the joy would be full of dancing and singing and celebrating. Because that's what God really wants in your life. He doesn't want some sourpuss, you know, that's sitting around going, 
Woe is me, I'm suffering for the sake of Christ. Woe is me, the world's ending, you know, and we're no longer a Christian nation. Oh, bummer! God failed. We're not succeeding. Fight me. <laughs> that's not Jesus. And that sure as hell is not the Lord my God. So read Colossians. You'll see. Otherwise, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand.